The year is 2003, and for video game publisher Rockstar Games, they're in the midst of their renaissance era. Following their genre-defining release of Grand Theft Auto 3 in 2001, Rockstar Games not only put out another hit with Grand Theft Auto Vice City, but also titles such as Max Payne 1 and 2 and Midnight Club in the intervening years. A lot of their iconic games of this period shared recurring themes of the protagonist underdog, crime, and a sense of underlying satire fueled by paranoia, disgust, and the ever-growing media instigating the matters at hand. No matter. People will read something into anything these days. Okay, and speaking of impossible, Jane from Cedar Grove is on the line, and she wants to talk about how difficult it is being a parent today. Hello, Jane. Hi, Laszlo. I love the show. I'm a first-time caller. I wanted to say something about these video games. They are warping our kids' minds. It was, and still is, a world that's still alive at the time of writing, and two decades on, we're still reeling for much of the aftermath. Despite this, though, Rockstar Games was living large. They were undeterred by the many controversies and conversations being made about their output, due to their graphic content and the way it's presented bluntly and harshly. Millions of kids are mastering it by learning to slaughter bystanders. Prior to Grand Theft Auto 3's jump to the third dimension of the franchise, the car stealing and the murdering of previous installments can easily be hand-waved as cartoony or humorous, and distinguishing it as such wasn't difficult. <laughs> However, by this point, beating people to death with a baseball bat or running them over with cars being literally behind the wheel became too real for many, reigniting the ever-present conversation of the influence of violent media, specifically video games, now more than ever. It is, as Michel Norris now reports, just the sort of game you'd like your 13-year-old to get his hands on. In 2003, when it became clear that this type of content was here to stay, with the success of Grand Theft Auto Vice City all upholding the glorified violence and the mature themes, it was obvious to many, not least to Rockstar, that it was worthwhile to see just how far it would go. The result of that ambition stemmed in a title that, two decades on, only has itself in a standalone sequel, with a cult following for those who are able to stomach it. This is Manhunt a gory, shocking, and needless to say, brutal game that not only still holds up on its own, but traces of its DNA persist in Rockstar to this day. So let's take a look. The general premise of Manhunt goes like this. You are James Earl Cash, a convicted criminal on death row. However, instead of being lethally injected, you end up being sedated. You're then recruited by a mysterious film director to carry out a series of brutal executions of other criminals throughout Carcer City for him to use in a snuff movie. If you don't know what that is, context clues might help you get the idea. It's not really material for sensitive stomachs. For a video game, the general premise rings more akin to a horror movie plot than anything else. Rockstar knew it had something unique on their hands, as even their team wasn't entirely all on board with it. If anything, a majority seemed to be uneasy with the game. Previously, with public discussions of Grand Theft Auto's violence, it can be reasonably hand-waved as discussed before. It was all parody anyway, former Rockstar employee Jeff Williams recalls on his personal blog. But with Manhunt, it was that the violence had been realistic violence. We were crossing a line. Overall, Manhunt features 20 levels, referred to as scenes, that play out on an impressive and immersive array of settings. You start off learning the ropes within the streets of Carcer City proper, before venturing in through a mall, a zoo, and industrial areas, before culminating in a mansion. Which is one thing to note about Rockstar, is their obsession of ending their games in a big mansion during this time period for some reason. If there's another one of the many recurring touches Rockstar has, it's also having distinct and notable enemies. Throughout the game, your enemies, or hunters as they're called, range across a diverse cast of criminals from multiple gangs. Many of their designs are fascinating, with my favorites being the smileys and the innocents, with the masks and the outfits that they don. Although some of the gangs that you encounter earlier on, such as the hoods and the skins, are pretty generic in my opinion. It's like if somebody asked, what does a bad guy look like? And from there, you're just given guys in hockey masks and leather jackets to beat you up. That's not to say it's not getting the job done, but thankfully, it gets more off the rails later on. Another thing to note about the hunters you encounter is their bizarre quotes. For instance, paralleling Grand Theft Auto again, 
One of the best parts is listening to whatever ridiculous things the pedestrians say when you're walking around. My mother's my sister. We're going to a robot. Here in Manhunt, you still get an aura with that, with every different gang member, who taunt the player in a variety of ways that correspond to their affiliation, as opposed to wanting to go to Aruba or something. Manhunt's core mechanic is the stealth aspect of the game. Now, stealth games back then weren't new by any means. After all, Metal Gear Solid effectively popularized the genre only five years prior. And as such, a lot of the general rules are familiar to gamers' experience with that genre. For those who aren't, it's still easy to understand. Simply put, don't make a sound and don't get seen. Manhunt's take on the stealth genre is effectively utilized in tandem with its execution mechanic. This is the preferred way to kill the hunters, which overall contributes to your score for the scene, and we'll get to that in more detail shortly. Stealth in the game works like this. Whenever your character is in these impossibly black areas throughout the level, you're hidden. This is confirmed by both your radar and your HUD, or heads-up display. Speaking of your radar, just as with Metal Gear Solid, you're gonna be pretty much looking at it a lot when in hunter-heavy scenarios. While Manhunt lacks an enemy field of view present, the status indicator by color and the importance of sound is still emphasized for the player. Oftentimes, this gives way to legitimately tense situations where you begin to really feel like cash, beating with sweat, weighing options on what to do next. Face. Not a damn thing. CCPD! It's really good when those moments happen, as the tension boils to a point when you're having to make a decision that's really risking your own safety and progress in the level for the sake of just getting past a singular hunter. Now, whenever you're not seen by the hunter, whether it be hiding in the shadows or they're simply just not looking at you, then now comes the time to perform the execution once they're targeted. Signified by the colors of gray, yellow, or red, is the intensity of such an execution. Okay. Even for me in 2023, and with this not even having realistic graphics, it's shocking to see the decapitation and castration possible in this game. It's not hard to imagine why employees at Rockstar were feeling uneasy about making this. It's also worth noting that this stealth aspect of Manhunt is carried over to many of Rockstar's following titles. While not as grisly by any means, this exact targeting appearance, the hiding in the shadows, and even the movement of the player's arm up to signal that it's ready to perform an execution is literally lifted from here to Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, which came out the following year. It's a fascinating example of Rockstar being easily able to transplant and refine systems taken from previous titles and incorporate them in following releases, something they've done throughout all of their mainline games, especially after Manhunt. Another one of the interesting things that Manhunt has as part of its mechanics is the strafing and the cover system that is featured throughout. For example, one of the ways the player can hide or to make noise is by strafing against walls. If on the edge and the enemy is approaching, then you can surprise them with an attack. Later on in the game, as guns become part of the ensemble, the covering system is also introduced. Similar to strafing behind walls or objects in the level to hide from enemies, if you have a gun, you can hide behind some cover and even shoot from there. It's fascinating because not only is this feature not present in San Andreas, but it isn't until Grand Theft Auto 4, a half decade later and after a bunch of other GTAs, that this even gets implemented. That's a next-gen title away from Manhunt, and here it is as early as 2003, still recognizable for anybody who's played those later games. There is a caveat though with these mechanics, however. It does not feel good to play sometimes. To be fair, I think it's just down to the game's age, which I can't really fault it for, but it's pretty clunky. This is also coming from a person who doesn't mind the tank controls of the original Resident Evil games. 
So honestly, I could just be biased, but hear me out. The main reason I feel this way about the controls is that it can be frustrating to perform executions or plan on any sort of strategy because of them. Actions can be easily thwarted by numerous things, ranging from the timing of switching weapons to the failure of auto-aim targeting, etc. It's things like this that make the later areas of the game feel needlessly difficult. Paired with the controls too is the camera system. You can tell they definitely still were trying to figure out how to make it feel as fluid and natural as it eventually would for their later games, but here it remains an apparent work in progress. It's as clunky, if not more so, due to the strafing and covering mechanics. Throughout my time playing the game, I honestly never fully got the grasp of it. On the subject of the camera, a cool feature they have in the game is the fact that you can look around in the first person to scope the area for any hunters. However, at least in my experience, I still ended up relying on just making a noise and watching out on my radar to see what popped up first before really using that feature. Otherwise, I didn't really feel the need to have that closer look that it offers. As a result, this first person view was seldom utilized for me, but I still wanted to give credit where it's due, as the harder difficulty version of the game removes that radar entirely. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the AI of the Hunters. Oh boy. The early 2000s ushered in so much revolutionary technology in such a short time span, so again, I'm not sure if it's fair to criticize heavily in retrospect, but regardless, it is notable enough to where I feel it still does affect the overall experience of the game at some points. For starters, there are numerous instances where the hunter's AI appears to be locked to a certain area where they're located, but it doesn't make sense. It's not like they're locked in by a door or a wall or anything, it's more that they're just specifically programmed to stay in the area. So if you're trying to lure them out, you can throw that out the window faster than throwing a decapitated head at them, since that won't get their attention. Sometimes it gets ridiculous because otherwise there are parts of the level where you're still so close to them and you'd assume that they would still check out whatever sound you're making to hopefully draw them in, but they will literally just ignore you. This is in contrast to the other parts of the game where they're sensitive as hell to run to wherever you're at. It's inconsistent and kind of irritating. In a way, and I might be reading too much into this, but it just reads off as kind of an indirect push from the developers, as if to nudge you along a more linear path in an otherwise open-ended sandbox-like game. It's kind of weird. What's also funny in regards to the AI is the relation to your status as a player on whether or not you're hidden. As I stated previously, as long as you're in one of those absurdly dark spots in the map and your character is marked as hidden, then you're effectively invisible past a reasonable amount. There has been many times where I was hiding in a corner, having an enemy approach dangerously close, but because I was hidden, they would walk away despite being practically an inch away from my face. It's a good thing that it's broken in this kind of way, but also not, since if you're not careful to watch the hunters or to learn the timing, they can easily turn right back around, ruining an execution right then and there. Speaking of kills, the game has a wide array of weaponry featured throughout for them. They're classified by four color-coordinated tiers, yellow, green, blue, and red. Essentially, the intensity of the color corresponds to how loud and how heavy the weapon is. For example, yellow being the lightest is pretty much reserved as items you'd want to lure the hunters with, often consisting of cans and bottles that can be thrown to distract them. On the other side of the spectrum, the red class includes stuff like the baseball bat and sniper rifle, so if you end up using them, you'll have to be more mindful of your surroundings with the sound that they emit. As most of the game is centered on stealth, a lot of the time it's the melee choices in the green and blue tiers that are the most encountered and used. These include stuff like glass shards, barbed wire, axes, and even handguns. With the execution mechanic in the game, that means all of these pretty much have their own distinct animations, which range from standard slasher movie flair to legitimately realistic and shocking, all the more since it's fairly graphic as a result. As you progress over the game, the storyline develops into more of a getting revenge, life or death situation that actually is engaging. It's not a deeply rich plot, but I get the feeling that Rockstar, especially at this point, were prioritizing game experience more than story. Regardless, the plot given is a good vehicle to carry the player from level to level, as it still carries a distinct tone to it that adds a lot to the overall atmosphere of the game, which is done real well. While playing through the game, the dynamics shift between Cash and who he has to kill to 
to earn his freedom. Despite being effectively another cold-hearted criminal, the game still gives you some moments of overall humanity to cash throughout, and it's enough to at least get you to feel for the situation he's in. For example, one scene involves Cash's own family members, who end up being pawns for the director in order for him to manipulate Cash to keep going on to play his game. This was clever of Rockstar, establishing a blank slate enough of a character to fit in a convincing kind of world for the player to really get into. It's not the first time they've done it, but it's still effective for what they're going for. Also, the game setting of Carcer City treads familiar ground for the developer too, as it's another gritty amalgamation of real-life cities with a flourishing crime scene that the player has to endure to rise above. Previously, it was Claude from GTA 3 who rose above Liberty City upon getting revenge on his former lover. Tommy from Vice City rose above through upstaging the other crime bosses, and now it's Cash who has to rise above Carcer City by killing his way to freedom. In the perpetual darkness of Manhunt's 20 scenes, running around the environment really gives you a feel for just how run down and depressing this setting is. Devoid of hope or positivity, Cash is relentlessly pursued by psychopaths and white supremacists in locations that you'd normally think of as populated and full of life like those zoos and malls. The police aren't any figure of upholding justice in the city either. Criminal status notwithstanding, the plot unravels to reveal a corrupt police force in tandem alongside everybody else in the city being after the player. Go figure. Overall, I feel that the atmosphere lends itself to being more horror than anything. The tension between the player and the hunters early on is well done in coordination with the map design. Even later on, despite the game getting more gun heavy, there are still legitimately scary moments, like when you're being chased in this decrepit residential complex by a man in a pig mask wielding a chainsaw, and you have nothing to fight back with. When all the pieces come together, the game does achieve what it strives for, and really well to boot, honestly. There were times when I was scared to make a move. There were times that I legitimately jumped up in surprise. Needless to say, it's a rare time for me when playing video games that I get this engrossed in the world. Feeling like the main character in the scenario and being so engaged and focused onto what's happening. Upon completing all 20 scenes in Manhunt, you get rated on how long it took for you to complete, and it even has a star system as well. Sound familiar? If you complete a scene under a specific time goal and also do enough executions for the amount of hunters in it, you can even also unlock bonus materials such as artwork and even additional scenes. It's a nice touch for completionists and a good challenge as well. Since the way the game is presented is a semi-sandbox with every scene, you can always try different routes and see how it work out on every different run. It's got some good replay value and kind of Dark Soulsian even. No, I'm not not even going to bother. That's a sh that's an awful fucking joke. I always wanted to play this game since I'm a big Rockstar and Grand Theft Auto fan, and this one eluded me for quite some time until it got available on sale on Xbox, which is how I was able to finally get around to it. Its reputation as a grisly and brutal game preceded itself, but it lived up to the expectation for me. Regardless of the faults in gameplay, as a whole, I still found it very enjoyable, enough as a sick curiosity to sit a good amount of hours to complete it. Manhunt, despite its marks from age, still holds up overall, especially in terms of the stylistic approach it aimed for, a gritty, exploitation slash horror type of film influence with the same rock star touches of the underlying satire of media and pop culture, albeit under a different lens here than of Grand Theft Auto. I mean, after all, the media commentary here looms large with the situation of a simply a character protagonist literally named Cash being taken advantage of by a psychotic film director from Hollywood, or in this game's canon, Vinewood, because yes, this is actually canon to the GTA universe. So I'm sitting here reading the Liberty Train. And it says in nearby Carcer City. But that's another point. Playing it today, you can really see how Manhunt fits in the overall canon of Rockstar Games. With the previews of its own future found in its mechanics soon to be carried to its more popular games ahead and the technology and aesthetic touches of its then contemporary era. I'd say it's worth checking it out if you're able to purchase it on console primarily, like on Xbox and PlayStation, as those ones are stable emulations of their original console renditions. True to another Rockstar Games tradition, unfortunately, the PC version available now on Steam is broken and 
needs a significant amount of fixing. It is playable if you do your homework though. If you're curious about the game after watching the video, or if you end up having an opportunity to play it, give it a shot. Two decades later, the impact of Manhunt's brutality remains potent. Regardless of the content, Manhunt remains to be a well-designed stealth game that accomplishes what it went for. There's a reason it upholds a cult reputation among gamers, despite a much darker, less comedic take on familiar ground, and despite being an underrated title in the Rockstar Games canon. Standing among the shoulders of blockbuster titles comes a game that lurks in the shadows, knowing its place in gaming history as a grotesque entry that still hits the mark to this day.